Hiya, Jeff. How are you doing? Hello there. Hi, Jeff. You okay? Yeah, good to see you. And you we, used and to you. have met, haven't you? We, yeah, yeah we, we did we... meet. Uh, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, no, last on, October. A, yeah, last October, a taggies on Anfield Road. Uh, I mean, I'd bought George Scott's book when he first launched it in lockdown, of course. He never had chance to launch it properly, you know, with a, a proper, you know, face-to-face launch. So it was delayed, and he he, he launched it at Taggies that night, and uh, in conjunction with Jeff and Kieran, who were there to launch the Untouchables as well. And uh, from what I believed on the night, there was going to be a, a couple of talks and one thing and another. But anyway, it got that shock of the night, and everyone just got talking away. The place was even; it was bouncing. You know, George Sefton was there, um, bumped into Alan Kennedy, who was there later on in the night. Um, and uh, as I left during uh, later in the evening, as I went to leave, I couldn't get my car out because Alan Kennedy had blocked me in. <laughs> so I had to come back and uh, I said, hey, Alan. And he thought I was having a go at him at first. I went, no, no, you know, I'm only laughing, you know, because I know him fairly well, Alan, like, you know. And uh, so any, anyway, he saw it in the end. But at first he looked a bit put out when I had a, you know, I said, hey, you, what do you car you? And he, looked, he didn't recognise me because I was sat in my car. But when I got out, he realised it was me. It was fine, like, but yeah. But what a nice, yeah, it was a, a busy one, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, yeah, we were absolutely delighted with it. And Alan was very generous with his time. He came along. He was only going to come for a short while, but of course he got mobbed. Uh, and last time I saw him, he was at the bar sharing stories with with anyone who wanted to talk to him. And we got we got a chance to have a chat. Kieran and I had a chance uh, to have a chat with him as well. And he's been very generous in terms of promoting the books. Uh, but yeah, it was just such a great night. And we did, we did plan to do a couple of talks, but... Uh, as you say, people just got chatting amongst themselves and seemed to be having a lovely time. We just thought we'd leave leave it at that and make it a celebration, uh, especially for George, because we worked on George's book with him and we were so excited to launch it. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and we never got a chance to do that. So this was an opportunity to give him the launch his book deserved, really, and it went down so well. It did, you bang on. And uh, I, mean, I got there quite early on that night and uh, spoke to George and his wife and had a chat and I thought, Oh, it's looking a bit thin on the ground here. But, of course, that was like half six at night, you know. By about eight <laughs> o'clock, you couldn't move. Yeah, no, it did. Uh, it, it sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, we couldn't have been happier with it, really. Yeah, really good night, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, yeah, before we talk about, well, we're going to detail chatting about the boost, Jeff. But tell us a bit about yourself outside of writing. Do you still work for the NHS? Uh, no, well, I, I worked for the NHS for, well, from 1993 until 2020 um and i was i was employed in the nhs initially as a nurse and then moved into education uh, and management and then i've kind of since moved into higher education so i work at the university of liverpool now in the school of medicine uh, so still very much involved in in healthcare related employment uh, and that's my day job that's that's what pays the bills as it were uh, but uh, outside of work, my my huge passion obviously is Liverpool Football Club, um, and in the last 10, 12 years has uh, has become writing about Liverpool Football Club, um, and so yeah, that's that's kind of me. Uh, I have a, a family. I live in Liverpool. Lived in Liverpool all my life. Um, I've got four kids. Married to a lovely wife. Um, yeah, so I spend my time with the family, writing and working, and that's basic. And going the match, so that's basically my life, and it's uh, it's a good one. We were there last uh, night. Did you, get, did you go? I was going to say, did you go last night? And, uh, <laughs> you, you were there. I did go Steve. last night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so did uh, I. Yeah. <laughs> it was a weird one, really, because I think I posted on on social media that on another night that's four one to Liverpool. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's absolutely. it's it's fine margins, isn't it? You know, and they scored a worldie, and that was a. Fantastic strike. Great goal, uh, wasn't it? Yeah. I thought we controlled the game throughout, um, but were punished for our, you know, rare, it's sort of quite rare that you say this about Liverpool, but our lack of a clinical edge, you know. Yeah, it almost reminded me of Roy Evans' uh, sides uh, back then when we'd hit the bar, we'd hit the post, and it go, what, wouldn't quite go in, you know what I yeah. mean? And uh, the times he could have won the league and we didn't, it just wouldn't go in. 
you know, the ball yeah. in the post twice, you think, is it ever going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they... last night it certainly looked that way. And the miss by Diaz at the end oh, was almost inexplicable, wasn't it? You know, the goal yeah. at his mercy and somehow the oh. defender gets a knee in the way. And it's over say, was it from a about three yards. Or was it a great clearance? Or well, was it maybe, just... maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. All right, it was frustrating to lose, but it was good to go through anyway. So that's a oh, yeah. Thing, I mean, you're going to lose, lose, lose in that manner, absolutely. you know, when it doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So did you get to, uh, obviously, you get to most of the home games, if not all of them. Did you go away as well, Jeff? Not so much these days, to be honest with you. Work and family kind of gets in the way of travelling away yeah. with the club. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I go to every home game and all the cup games as well. Season ticket and I'm in the Auto Cup scheme. So I, I, ve- I never miss a match unless I'm ill. Um, same as me. Same as me. Yeah. Um, exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, the books, do you want to give us like a, I don't know, maybe a two minute introduction to each of them? There's six all together. Yeah, there's six now. Um, so, yeah, so I, I started out, it was the club's 125th anniversary in 2017. Um, and I'd been in conversation with This Is Anfield about doing something around, because I write for This Is Anfield, as you know. And I was in a conversation with them about doing something around the club's anniversary and we came up with this idea of 125 individual stories um, to sort of mark the 125th anniversary. So we'd, we'd sort of span the whole history of the club from 1892 right through to 2017, which was a, a monumental task, um, but one that really, really excited me. And it also appealed to my kind of... I don't really see myself, I just sound weird to say this, but I don't really see myself as a football writer. I see myself as a storyteller who happens to like writing about football. A historian um, as well, Jeff, then? Well, yeah, kind of. I'm a social historian, yeah, so I'm yeah. fascinated by the social history of the game. Um, and so it kind of appealed to my creative side. I thought I can get like, quite creative with this idea and I can tell it from the people's perspective. Um, and so that that led to Red Odyssey, which was the, the first book I published in 2017, published by Pitch Publishing, who made my dreams come true, really, by taking a chance on me. Um, and then and then I kind of had this one in the draw, um, Stanley Park Story, which uh, after the success of Red Odyssey, I thought, well, I'll, I'll strike while the iron's hot. I've got this, this one in the draw. Um, it's not good enough to be published now, but I can work on it. Um, and that was a kind of novel, um, a historical novel uh, based around the Merseyside Derby and two families, one red, one blue. Um, and a kind of uh, a friendship and a romance wo- woven through uh, the book that kind of mirrors the relationship between the two clubs and the two sets of supporters. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so I pitched that to them and that became Stanley Park story. Um, which is kind of a little bit of a play on West Side Story. Um, um, And then, then of course, Liverpool won the European Cup, so that led to to We Conquered All of Europe, which was the second in the Red Odyssey series. So Red Odyssey has now become um, a trilogy, um, so it kind of takes us, takes the journey from 1892 right through um, to the title win um, in, in 2020. So... Um, so we've got We Conquered All of Europe, Red Odyssey 2, and then we've got um, the uh, Champions Under Lockdown, which is Red Odyssey 3. Um, and then kind of, I thought I'd, I'd leave it at that, but then I was contacted by George, um, who'd read some of the stuff. He'd read Stanley Park's story. And he wanted to talk to me, and I, I didn't know at the time. Uh, I was planning to go and speak to George with the intention of writing an article about him, doing an interview piece, and this is Anfield. This is George Scott. Um, George Scott, sorry, yeah. 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 Me assuming you can read my mind and know exactly <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I mean. Um, so I can't, we met in the Shankly Hotel, of course, uh, for a pint, and my plan was to interview him and do an article for this is Anfield. Uh, but we got chatting and I kind of suddenly realised there's, there's way more to an article here, there's way more to an interview. What an incredible story George has got. Of course, George is the 
you know, it's the it's the hero's journey, really. So he, he's a young lad from a fairly modest background, living in a small village in Aberdeen. Uh, he's 15, and he takes this huge journey on his own to Liverpool. He didn't even know where Liverpool was before he set off, and he sets off on this train journey with his suitcase and £20 off his granddad in his hand. Yeah. Uh, and he meets this incredible figure. It could almost be Merlin or Gandalf or, you know... Bill Shankly, and his life is transformed as a result. He kind of goes through this transformation. And I thought, oh, this is this is more than an interview. This is an incredible story. Um, so George and I chatted a bit and we decided that we we'd give it give it a go and, and and you know look at producing his autobiography together. Um, and again, pitch again came in, came up trumps with us on that one and, and helped us publish that one. Um and so I must, I must admit, the feedback we've had uh, for George's autobiography has been incredible. And George is, um, you know, absolutely delighted with it. He sees it as, and I see it as his legacy, really. That's his kind of, you know, his legacy for his kids and his grandkids. Um, you know, and it tells a story that hasn't been told about the Shankly era. And then the latest one, uh, working, so I'm a social historian. Um, but I have to say, the kind of to, I don't consider myself a genuine historian because the, that's hard work, and <laughs> uh, the expert in kind of crawling over archives and unearthing um, details and um, really helping me with that side of it is Kieran Smith, who's a fantastic Liverpool historian who runs the LFC History page on Facebook. He's done tremendous work with the club in terms of restoring the graves of former Liverpool players. Um, and so Kieran and I, so what had happened was I, I planned to write a, a book about one of the players of the 1920s, Tom Romolo, who, who I found a fascinating character because he'd served in World War I. He'd demobbed, come home to Liverpool. He was born in Kirkdale, lived in Kirkdale. Uh, and just just decided to walk into Anfield one day and ask for a game. Um, and was given a trial, given a trial in the reserves and ended up captain in the team eventually. Um, but he was part of that, that famous team that won back-to-back -back titles in the early 1920s. So I was going to write a story, a book about him. I got chatting to Kieran about it to see what he knew. And it, it, it was obvious that Kieran was thinking of doing something similar, but about about that era. So it kind of was a no brainer for us to work together on the untouchables. And what we've done is we've produced, I think the most detail, well, I, it is the most detailed accounts of that, that period, but it's not a, just a football book. It's not about the games and the matches. It's about the lives of the people who played for Liverpool, who followed Liverpool and watched Liverpool and who managed and ran Liverpool football club. And it takes us from like their early lives through to, you know, what happened to them afterwards. Um, so it, it, it kind of is something that will hopefully stand, you know, for future generations to really truly understand the achievements of this team. And we were very fortunate. In fact, the book is so much better for the cooperation of some of their descendants and family members who've contributed massively to the book in terms of photographs, mementos and stories. Um, so it really, you know, has enabled us to produce something very, very rich. I know you said two minutes. I hope I haven't gone over. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I could listen all day. Hey, yeah, so, so, so that's, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. six books, basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Ask, how, how did it yeah, work yeah. with um, splitting the work up with Kieran? Did you do like a chapter each or did you say, right, I'll look at this particular aspect of it and you look at another? How, how did you share it? How did you collaborate? So predominantly, my, my talent is storytelling. My talent is taking the raw information yeah. and, and weaving that into a story um, that is hopefully informative, because it's got to be informative, but entertaining critically and crucially. Um, Kieran's real talent is as a historian, and he gives the rigour to the book. So there's nothing in that book that hasn't been thoroughly cross-checked and researched there may be bits that are later shown you know and there's always a risk with a history book the new information emerges later but there's nothing in that book that hasn't been rigorously researched and cross-checked so Kieran's primary role was was the research and the producing the data and the information for the book my primary role 
was writing. Um, however, there's a little bit of crossover. So there's some bits where, so I'll give you an example. Uh, the rules of the game were incredibly complicated back then. The rule for offside is is unfathomable. Uh, and, and Kieran, um, Kieran really managed to get his head around it. Um, you know, if you have a look, we put a, a, a passage in the book of the offside rule, and I defy anyone to, to explain it to me better than Kieran. Um, so I just said to Kieran, you, you write that, you write those paragraphs and, and explain it, you know. Because I, I, no matter how many times you explain it to me, I can't get it into my head. So there's examples of that. And equally with the research, there's examples where, for example, one of the players was, he served in World War One. He, he was very unfortunate. He wasn't uh, drafted until 1918 under the Military Services Act. Um, and he only spent a few months out on the front, uh, but was shot, was, was um, seriously injured on, on the battlefield. And so we were able to place him on the battlefield. We knew what regiments he was in. We knew when he shipped out. We knew whereabouts in France he was. We knew what hospital he was transported to. Um, and we knew the circumstances of, of how he got injured as well. He was doing a relief operation, uh, relieving troops who were in the trenches. He was taken over, notoriously risky. Um, and so what we wanted to know is how would he have been treated and how how would he have got from that point to the hospital? So we could get a bit of a picture of how it would have felt for him and how horrifying and difficult the journey would have been, which it was. And we also wanted to know what conditions of the hospital were like, um, who would have seen to him. So I did that bit of research around that. So it, there's a little bit of us both doing bits of each, but predominantly uh, Kieran's the historian, I'm the writer. So um, when you've done this research over most of your books, actually, you've obviously had to approach LFC. Have they been very cooperative with you and uh, very helpful? The guys in the museum, maybe, is it Stephen Doan from the museum and people like him? Or Yeah, we've got, to, we've got to pay a huge thanks, really, to some key figures at the club. Um, so uh, Mark Platt, um, at LFC TV, so he's a producer at LFC TV, incredibly generous with his time. Uh, I have to say, I wasn't sure how the club would respond. Um, and Mark actually reached out to us before we even got going. So as soon as we he knew we were we were doing the book, we we gathered quite a lot of information. We hadn't even sat down and started mapping out the structure. And I got an email from Mark Platt saying, um, you know, I think it's fantastic. It's definitely needs doing. Uh, it's a period I'm fascinated about. If there is anything I can do, uh, don't hesitate to ask. And he was as good as his word. You know, we've, we, we managed to get quite a lot of um, archive footage and photographs um, from the club with permission of the club to reproduce. Stephen Doan, very, very helpful. Johnny Stockland, um, the club's official archivist, uh, invaluable in terms of you know, confirming dates and contracts and contract expiries and all of those things. So, yeah, I've got to say on Untouchables, uh, understandably, the club wants to manage um, how it's represented uh, and wants to make sure that it's represented fairly and accurately. So it very has a very rigorous process in terms of how it engages with, with authors who aren't, who, aren't, who aren't writing official works. Um, but I have to say on Untouchables, um, we, we couldn't ask for more from the club. Your website, it says that um, you've always wanted to be a writer, in particular horror fiction. Have you got other sort of purely outside of football stories hidden away in your, your bottom writer's drawer? Yeah, no, I mean, not many are completed <laughs> um, because, you know, other demands um, kind of take precedent. But it's probably fair to say that I've wanted to be a writer or I've nursed an ambition to be a writer since I was a kid. I just never really made a serious stab at it until about 10, 12 years ago. Um, so I have lots of, I've got notepads up in the attic full of, <laughs> you know, ideas for stories, short stories. I've got two or three projects that, you know, when I retire, 
uh, from full-time employment. There's two or three fiction projects that I want to work on. And even if I have to self-publish them and I can't, you know, if I can't get a publisher, um, you know, I will publish them. And horror fiction's always been a passion of mine. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of something I would like to do, definitely. Um, that, that short story you've got on your website, that, uh, that's quite chilling, actually. Which one's that? It's about the, the ghost, the, the kid he goes to the, or the bloke he goes to the police station to confess to a murder. And he finds oh, that. Yeah. And he, I won't spoil yeah, the story, you, any, if, but it's, it's... If you're faint of heart, don't read yeah, Exactly, that. yeah. I should probably <laughs> take them down, actually. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Trying to cultivate this image of a, of a football writer. Get me awake um, at night, but yeah, there's all it. this weird stuff on my website, yeah. But, you know, that yeah. was a kind of break. I, I found that quite, quite, um, quite challenging to do, really, because... That was the start of the journey into having a serious go, was creating the website, because putting something out there, I mean, you'll understand. Um, but when you put something out there, it's like you're putting a little piece of yourself yeah, out yeah. there in public to be to be shot down. Or, yeah. um, and it's it, it's quite, it takes a bit, a bit of nerve to do. And it was great, you know, and I was always, I remember every time I posted something or published something, I was always incredibly nervous about the feedback. Um, yeah. And that's how you know whether you've got a chance of being any good at mm. some point is once you start putting it out there. Yeah. And I would advise anyone to do that, you know. Uh, you know, you, you do get knocked. Um, you do get fair criticism, you know. Tend to think, as Stephen King said, if if you get wound up by your critics, they're probably right. <laughs> so they're worth listening to. Um, but, I, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do if you want to write is to write, just write and put it out there and take the knocks and get better with every knock you get, pick yourself back up and be better the next time. It's the only way with anything, with any skill, I think. If you've got yeah. an inclination to do it, you'll never do it unless you start writing. Yeah. I mean, you've got a full-time job, you've written all these books and you do the uh, LFC fanzines like, you know, this is Anfield and all the stuff. How do you find all the time to fit it all in? And how much time is taken up with all the fanzine type work, which is obviously you enjoy doing it, but how much how much of your time do you have to put in to, to just writing and fanzines? Uh, a lot. <laughs> Too much according to my family, I would I would suggest. Uh, I think one of the things about my writing habits, um, after just waxing lyrical about, you know, you should just write, is I am I am a big procrastinator. Um, so I tend to work well with the deadline. So if I have a deadline for submission of the 30th of June, you know, it'll be it'll be closer to the 30th of June than most people would be comfortable with before I start. So I do kind of manage to make sure I do all the important family and work stuff and then and then I will go hell for leather and it'll be, you know, like writing late into the night, early hours, all my weekends consumed. And that kind of seems to work for me. It probably isn't everybody's preferred approach. Uh, in terms of the writing for the online material, I, again, it's about rhythm, I think. So when I'm writing articles or features for the online or the fanzine material, you know, I've kind of now, after writing for about 10 or 12 years, I've got myself into a real rhythm and, and I, can, I can produce, you know, 1,500 words article 2000 word article in a in a couple of hours so it is possible to get up on a Saturday morning you know before everyone else and, and knock out a you know a, a, a decent feature piece um but that you know I wasn't always able to do that you know take me days and days and um but it is about developing your writing habits and your, your pattern I think and one and your style your voice um, and what it's like anything else, any deliberate practice, any skill, it starts to become automated. It starts to become subconscious. You're not really thinking about what you're doing. You just you're doing it, and then you might go over and edit it and correct mistakes and stuff. But it tends to it tends to be quite automatic sometimes. If that makes sense, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Sure. Yeah, it, it does. does. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the more you do it, the more experience you get at doing it and the easier it becomes I suppose it snowballs doesn't it I suppose it does yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Jeff, can I yeah, yeah. can I ask you about the, the, the publishers pitch pub, publisher we've spoken to uh, Peter Kenny Jones about you know his Billy Little book Billy Little at 100 
also published with Pitch Publishers. Yeah. How did you get with them? We spoke to so many writers who've got so frustrated because they can't get a traditional publisher or an agent, so they go down the indie route. How, how did you make contact with them? Do you think you were lucky? Do you think it was because of the quality of your work? Obviously, it's, it has a quality. Um, well, you know, I like to think the I like to think the quality is there. Yeah. Um, but I do think there's an element of luck. I think there's mm-hmm. always an element of luck. Right place, right time. Yeah. Uh, I'd submitted articles in the past to various publications that have been rejected. Um, but I think I had a, I think I had the right idea at the right time. So li- we know Liverpool books sell. So they're appealing to publishers because they sell. They've got such a massive worldwide fan base. Um, it was the 125th anniversary um, of the history of the club. And I had a book with 125 stories about Liverpool Football Club. Uh, so I just, I basically took a punt. I got hold of a um, great guy at Pitch, Paul Camillo, um, who's one of the directors of Pitch. I got hold of his details. And I just sent him a speculative uh, message saying, I've got this idea. I've written it. It's ready to go. Are you interested? And to my utter amazement, he said yes. And in fact, right up until I had the book in my hand, I kept waiting for someone to call me or tap me on the shoulder and say, I'm sorry, we've made a terrible mistake. We <laughs> meant someone else. Uh, but no, and, and they've they've been right behind me, you know, ever since. I've um, been working with them, as you know, on sick books now and actually got um, a, a few more in the pipeline. Um, so I've been a delightful process working with them. Uh, very easy to work with. Um, I think all the books look great. The covers are all down to Dun- Duncan Olner, who is uh, a great, you know, part of their design team. Duncan Olner designs. Um, I have to say my personal favourite is Untouchables. I think the cover of Untouchables is fantastic, but I think he's done a oh, fantastic yeah. job on yeah. on all of the. Yeah, it's right behind you there. Uh, I mean, it, it's it, the process is is really um, the process is really straightforward. You know, you give your your thoughts and your ideas about what you would like it to look like or what the book's about, and you know the kind of ethos of the book. Uh, maybe offer some, as with Untouchables, we gave him some pictures to work with. And then he goes away and creates, you know, weaves his magic and creates the cover. Uh, Peter Kenny Jones has booked the cover on that. It's just perfect, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Super it's it's yeah. just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Book, it's simple, but it works so well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, any writers out there, I mean, there are other publishers out there. Um, I don't have shares in pitch publishing. Um <laughs> No reason for me to promote pitch publishing other than to say I've had a great experience working with them. So if you are looking for a publisher, they, they are worth giving, you know, giving it a try. Excellent. So what's uh, in the pipeline coming up next writing wise? Uh, are you like able to say or are you keeping it under wraps? No, no, I'm absolutely, yeah, I'm willing to, willing to say. So um, we've got, uh, I've got an agreement with pitch um, um, on the next three. Um, two of them are collaborate. It's, well, no, one of them's a, two of them are collaborations, and one I'm working on solo. So I'll be working on with Mark Platt, um, the treasure in the ruins, which is the story of George Kay, who was Liverpool's manager before and after World War II. Um, Liverpool won the first league title immediately after uh, World War II in 1947. And he'd been at the club. He'd recruited the likes of um, Billy Liddle and Bob Paisley and, uh, and people like that. And he created a fantastic team. Uh, arguably, the team that came after the title win was better than the team that won the title, but never managed to get over the line again. Of course, got to the FA Cup final in 1950 and lost to Arsenal. Um, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll cover that untouchable style. So we'll do a deep dive into that period and the people. And then I'm also going to be working with Kieran again on um, the first two title wins. So that's going to be a mammoth undertaking and a huge challenge because of the distance in time. Uh, but we're going to go for a, the story of those two first title winning teams. And my aim is to have a, a deep dive into the whole history of the club. Um, and then uh, the, the, the other one I'm working on 
is uh, the autobiography, the biography of Tommy Lawrence, oh, Liverpool, Shankly's goalkeeper. Yeah. And I am hugely honoured uh, and inspired that Tommy's family approached me and, and asked me, would I, would I take on um, uh, Stephen Lawrence, Tracy yeah. Murray? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they, they've asked me to take on their dad's story and I, certain amount of pressure to that and certain amount of, you know, as there was with George Scott, uh, you know, you're dealing with someone's legacy here, um, but hugely honoured to take that on and do that and um, determined to do him to do him justice and then proud. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Tommy Lawrence, I made up with that. I didn't know that, actually. I know they were there that night at Taggy's and uh, you were talking to them, but... That was probably part of the conversation you had as well, was it? <laughs> well, yeah, we'd spoken before the night, to be fair, but but that was part of the conversation, yeah. Um, yeah, and already, you know, as you can imagine, because he's such a beloved figure uh, in the history of the club, there are people lining up uh, to talk to me about, you know, with, with their own stories of Tommy, um, which is just going to make the book so much richer, you know. Um, because it's going to have real personal recollections of Tommy that maybe other people haven't heard before. Um, and we'll really get into the, you know, we'll get into his soul and, and, and understand him as a character and, and his place in Liverpool history, which, you know, I honestly think is a bit underrated. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, he was a pioneer, he was a goalkeeper and pioneer. Um, and, you know, part of that team that won the club's first FA Cup Part of the resurgence under the Shank under Shankly's revolution, um, you know, should be celebrated. I mean, he is celebrated, but should be celebrated more than he is, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, yeah, no, really. no. yeah I'll, I'll, I'm going to read it now. Yeah, Jeff, I'm where, <laughs> I'm where at the time. The last thirty minutes has just flown by. It was just to me and Steve. I think we chat on. Probably night. because I never shut up. No. <laughs> It's all top interest stuff for both of us, obviously, you know, big <laughs> Liverpool yeah. fans. Definitely, cool. yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate your time anyway, Jeff. Um, and let's keep in touch and hopefully have maybe another chat with the uh, when the new book comes out. Tommy I'd love book. that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Brilliant. 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 Yeah. Excellent stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Oh, lovely to see you guys and thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. your time. And Cheers, you, Jeff. Jeff. Take care, yeah. Cheers, mate. All right. Thank you.